morning, everyone. My name is Rinka Gupta from Argon National Lab. And uh, in this module, I am going to be talking about software testing and how, how it is used in the development process in scientific uh, computing. So this is our license slide out here. And uh, this, this presentation has a lot of material and I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly. The slides will be available for you to glance over if you want to revisit it. The presentation module is divided into two parts. In the first part, we'll talk about testing concepts and terminology. We will discuss some of the challenges of testing in scientific computing. And then I'll quickly show you an example of how to set up a Python project with testing. And then we'll discuss how to use the CMake framework for a C and C++ projects. Uh, in the second part of the presentation, I will quickly walk uh, through a testing method for larger and more complex projects based on something called as a heat equation. And, uh, and then we'll take on from there. Now, who, who is the audience for this presentation? This presentation hopefully will provide some useful information for to all of you. The first group of people are people who are new to software testing and are looking for advice on how to get started. And the second group is those who are working with le legacy projects, but need to use or integrate uh, uh, a testing system with their existing code. And the third groups, uh, group uh, maybe are people who are using testing, but are looking at ways to improve their uh, testing practices on existing projects. Now, there's a lot of theory and associated terminology about testing, and sometimes it can be confusing. So for this tutorial, we'll focus on what is called as dynamic testing, which is testing by executing the code itself. And uh, tests are often separated, separated into two types, functional testing and non-functional testing. Now, functional testing is testing all components systematically against a set of requirements or specifications. For example, unit testing, integration testing, acceptance testing, and so on. Non-functional testing, on the other hand, is related to how the program operates or behaves. For example, it could be performance testing or stability testing or security testing. Uh, there are many different test types of tests and testing strategies, and I'll just mention a few common ones. And the first three on the slide are somewhat of a hierarchy. So at the bottom, we have unit testing, which is really to check if a single routine or a single function is operating correctly. The next level is integration testing, which is to check whether a group of components or functions are operating correctly. Then you have system testing, which is to check if the program operates correctly as a whole and meets specific requirements. And then in addition to this, there are other strategies like regression testing, which is, which is to check if the changes that you may have uh, introduced in the code, they've not caused problem to the expected behavior of the code. And there's acceptance testing, which is kind of similar to a system testing, but it checks the program as a whole uh, and, and ensures that the software meets the, you know, the requirements of uh, the customer. So uh, how does, what is verification validation? How does it relate to testing? Now the terminology for verification validation is a little different in scientific computing versus software engineering. So verification in software engineering means that you, know, you are checking that the software conforms to the design uh, and the requirements. And this is of course beyond testing to ensure that the documented requirements are all met. Testing in software engineering plays an important role in the verification process. Uh, to check and make sure that each aspect of the code is working as it should be. In scientific computing, on the other hand, verification aims to ensure that the co code is a correct uh, representation of our underlying mathematical model. And many times uh, verification involves comparing the model solution to a reference solution, checking for convergence and so on and so forth. So that's verification. Validation in software engineering is used to check and determine if the code meets the customer needs. So it, it can be system level or acceptance testing may need to be performed. But in scientific computing, validation is much more complex because it may involve determining the accuracy of the model, comparing the output with experimental results, and, and, uh, and it may sometimes also involve using a computational model to make predictions that can later on uh, be verified. Testing within this slide out here shows uh, testing within the software development life cycle. Now, scientific software development is a complex project, a complex, complex process, and there are many parties involved with uh, you know, expertise in different subject areas. 
So from the slide, you can see in the physical world, you may have domain experts who understand the overall problem. They may have a set of models in mind. They may have, they may propose equations that are required to solve the problem. Also, the domain scientists may have, would have considered well validation checks arising from different, you know, physical mathematical properties of their models. So you have the domain experts, and then you see applied uh, mathematicians out here who take all these equations and uh, work with numerical solvers and work with uh, discretizers, and they have a good understanding of functional spaces, convergence criteria. They can address issues uh, related to model fidelity and so on. And then you have computer software engineer, computer scientists out here that map the problem into you know, programming models. They contribute things like uh, extensible interoperable frameworks with a focus on productivity, sustainability. So you can see from the slide that testing in the software development life cycle offer, like, happens in different parts and many parties are involved out here. So now the question is that, uh, when should a test be written? When you actually write the test in reality, often testing is left until the very last possible minute. And that's not good because tests sometimes are written as an afterthought. They are added to later on test the code or test for bugs. But rather than adding the test as an afterthought, it has been shown that writing the test before you write the code can lead to great outcomes. And this is known as test-driven uh, development, also called as TDD. Now, one of the advantages of test-driven development is that now developers can think about what it means for a problem to be correct. They're not trying to just see what their function is trying to do, but they understand the overall goal of the problem. Another advantage is that uh, because the tests themselves are comprehensive and they have to be written in advance before writing the code, they, they end up becoming uh, the specification for the eventual program. But there are challenges uh, to this because you have to take care in writing tests. You have to think carefully about what you're testing because really there's no code at that point, right? So people are not used to doing it and therefore it could be challenging. You also need to make sure that you run the test very frequently. And this is where things like continuous integration comes in. We will touch upon it later on. And one important thing is that when you're using TDD, uh, you should be using it across you know, the whole team. You don't want some people writing tests before the code, some people writing tests after the code. It has to be adopted by the entire development team. So, uh, so what does this TDD look like? You know, what does test-driven development look like? How, uh, how does it work? So the first step is to actually write a test that describes a particular aspect of the program that you are trying to implement. It can, as I said, it could be a bit challenging for people to figure out the functionality uh, of the software before you actually code it, but it is an important step. Now, once you've written that, you run the test. Now, of course, the test uh, have just been written, they're going to fail because that feature does not exist yet, right? So the next step is to write enough code to make the test pass. And so this cycle of writing enough code, running the test, writing enough code, running the test, this continues until you get, until you get to a point where all the tests pass. Now, in that iterative process, you would have used shortcuts. You could have introduced some temporary code that may not be best from maybe sustainability point of view. So the next thing to do once the code has been written and the test passes is to refactor the code and you remove all this extra stuff that you've added and you make sure that the code conforms to any requirement uh, that the project has. And at this point, you've reached a stage where you've implemented that specific piece of functionality that you set out to do. And then you just continue to the next piece of functionality and you do the same process over and over again till we have completed the entire specification of uh, the program. Now, research software has some pretty unique challenges compared to traditional software. Uh, you know, so let's deviate a bit and talk about what are the challenges in scientific computing uh, research software. So first, let's talk about exploratory software, right? The primary thing in research software is essentially we're exploring new areas and we don't really uh, know what the expected outcome can be. So even, uh, even after all the expected behavior of the program, after we've checked it, we still have to rely on domain experts to help validate the model and to iterate on the design. So it's a bit different compared to software engineering. Uh, in software engineering, you have a pretty clear idea of what the outcome is gonna be, and you can just go and implement it. So there are some challenges in testing uh, uh, in scientific computing uh, because of the exploratory nature. 
Also, a lot of scientific computing codes are legacy codes, and uh, that can be difficult because uh, legacy codes have a lot of expected behavior. They may not have any tests written for them, or the tests may be lost, or the, developer, the developers may have quit. And adding new tests can be a problem because we may not know much about the code, how it interacts, what part of the codes are working, and so on. So in the test-driven development approach, the very accepted way is to move forward with legacy codes. You don't, you don't try and implement tests for everything, but you begin implementing tests for whatever new functionality that, is, that you add. Lastly, I will talk a bit about release codes or production codes. You know, the third group, this, this is a third group of uh, codes. And typically, uh, these codes are, available, are made available to the broader community. And what is required in these circumstances is a thorough code review, which verifies each part of the code and addresses all the intended users. And we need to ensure that you know, whatever fixes we are making in such codes go through, so the testing approach could be quite different compared uh, to our, you know, um, to, to our uh, traditional testing methods. So now I want to jump in and uh, discuss how to set up a Python project with testing. In this first example, I'm going to show you how to set up a new project that you can immediately start to develop, implement, and, uh, and, and test. Writing code in Python is very, very, very easy. You just start with a text file. And uh, first of all, in order to do this, we are going to have to install a couple of Python packages if you already don't have them installed. Uh, we are going to use something called as PyScaffold to create a Python package. And this will include the necessary files for the packaging and for the building of code. What is PyScaffold? It is, you can think of it as a, as a, as a it's essentially a project generator and it's used for bootstrapping Python code, you know, uh, Python packages, high quality py Python packages. So what we do is to install PyScaffold, you, you just type the command pip install PyScaffold and that should install it. Pip is a package installer for Python. Uh, so we install that. We also ins do pip install talks Docs is a package that manages the test within the, within the project. And we go ahead and install that. And that's all we need. We just need to install these two packages. Then uh, PyScaffold provides a command called put up. And this is all available on the screenshot on the slide. I hope you can see it. Uh, so Py, uh, PyScaffold provides this command called put up, which, essen uh, which essentially creates a new project. So we put, say put up auto QCT. And that essentially uh, creates a project uh, with a scaffolding. And it incorporates tests within the skeleton module, and then you can modify and create your own program. So then we just simply run. Uh, uh, we can simply run the tox command. And when you run the tox command, you will see this output that you see on the big black screen out here. And you see that it actually runs this uh, test called PyTest on your behalf. And it will run, a, the PyTest will have a bunch of tests that is done. So it will run some kind of a Fibonacci test. It will run a main test. And you can see that this test have like passed uh, to some degree. Uh, and uh, one bonus thing that scaffold, PyScaffold provides it, it provides code coverage. So it also runs a code coverage command. It will show you how much code coverage your tests are achieving. And now you can, you know, once you have this in place, you can essentially customize this whole thing by adding, uh, you know your own files, and this has good documentation of op op options with Sphinx. It has, uh, it's, it's a nifty, nifty thing to use. So let's talk now a bit about the codes that are based on C, C plus plus Fort, Fortran. And for such codes, uh, the CMake build system is very popular, and CMake itself provides a you know pretty easy way to build tests with something called as a C test framework that is available in it by default. Uh, so out here you can see the CMake list or text file. And you essentially have to may add a few lines or macros to this text file. Uh, to make it uh, easier. Now, uh, I, I put a mention of this, uh, this thing called BLT, which is basically a project from Lawrence Livermore National Lab that essentially provides a set of make files uh, that can be used for designing and building, that can be used for building Google tests or, you know, fruits, that is the Fortran. And it provides code coverage, it provides code in continuous integration, it's documented. So it's, uh, again, a good thing to use. And in this example, out here, we, uh, I'm, I'm trying to show how to easily create a CMake infrastructure. So uh, the first 
uh, screenshot out here shows C make list file. We add a bunch of macros out there. And at the very end, we use put a put a state uh, put a line say which says include blt setup blt dot cmake, and this will incorporate the blt functionality into your project. The next few steps essentially consists of cloning the blt repo, uh, building our project by running cmake and make, and eventually you can see that you know you are running the test command which will run all the tests, and then you see that the test tests have all passed. So now going further, if you want to explore C, C++, Fortran, there are a variety of different tools for running and reporting on tests. For example, C Dash is a reporting and monitoring tool. PF unit is a Fortran unit test framework. There's flash test that's coming from an ECP project. There are code coverage tools, there are static tools, and you have you know, tools, uh, similar tools for Python as, as well. Now, so if you, even if you're trying to do test-driven development, uh, where you write the test first, it's useful to know how much code is actually being tested. And that's where code coverage tools come in. Code coverage tools essentially allow you to visualize the lines of code uh, that are being tested. And there are different types of code coverage tools. GCOV that is mentioned out here is a standard utility that comes uh, with the, the GNU compiler. There are different coverage tools for there are different code coverage tools tools for different languages. There's something called LCOV, which is a graphical front end for GCOV, and it's fairly fairly simple uh, to use something like GCOV. You need to use a particular option when you're compiling the code, and then you can run the code and you can use the GCOV tool that will take the generated output and annotate the source uh, source code with the coverage information. I think uh, we have that screenshot in this slide. Right, so out here on this slide, uh, you can see that the source code is annotated. And so for every line out here, it will tell you uh, how many times that particular line has been executed. If in front of the line, if you see hash symbols or pound symbol, it means that the line was not executed at all. So you can see, you can basically see what is executed, what is not. Uh, I, I like this quite a bit. This slide shows more tools, uh, graphical tools uh, out here, and they are like online tools that will help you visualize coverage. Okay, so we barely have any time, but for this last part of the module, I want to quickly walk through on how to use test-driven development for large complex code. Uh, we talk about the heat equation, and again, the slides are available to you to you know, look at it in great detail later on. So the hello world example out here is essentially an implementation of the heat equation. On the slide, you can see that there are a lot of uh, source code files that are provided that already implement the heat equation framework on how the code actually runs. And there are swappable kernels that, are, that, are, that implement different algorithms that are provided as well. So F FTCS is one such kernel that has been provided. And our goal is to add a new kernel called Upwind 15 to use uh, the test, uh, test uh, TDD process. So now the first few steps are easy. We download the code, we run the CMake command, we run the make command, and then we actually we run the actual code by using the FTCS kernel, and then we see that uh, you know things uh, things are working. And again, as I, as I said, our goal is to add a new kernel called Upwind 15. So we want to add this new kernel. So we first need because we are following the TDD approach, we first need to add the tests, and then and we need to decide what are we testing. Whereas perhaps we are testing the convergence of the algorithm, or we are testing if the output is in a steady state. Or we, or we are looking at multiple precision. So we need to decide uh, what we are uh, testing. And in this slide and the next slide, we actually go ahead and create the test. So if you see, we are creating the test, we are enabling testing. So we are adding a test which checks the existing FTCS kernel. And then we are adding the test which checks the upwind kernel, uh, upwind 15 kernel. And then we run the test. And of course, the FTCS kernel test will pass because it's existing. Upwind 15 will fail because that kernel doesn't exist yet, right? We have just written the test for it. So now the next step is to add the new kernel to make the text uh, to make the test succeed. And so this slide shows that you know we uh, uh, the, that kernel was written somewhere by someone, and we are adding it to the source. And you can see that this kernel has been added to the source. We rerun the test. And when we rerun the test, we see that uh, we, uh, uh, the FTCS kernel passes and the upwind 15 kernel passes as well. And with that, we've completed the first iteration of our uh, test-driven development cycle. And then of course, uh, you can go ahead and improve on it 
this slide has like some more ideas that you can uh, try out to you know have different strategies so i went through this portion fairly quickly but as i said the slides are available and are in great and, and, are, and are present in great detail so take a look at it coming to the summary a productive software team is always checking their work in some way using some type of testing and it's a good idea to mirror the logic of your logical structure of your code into your tests uh, because it un helps understand how the tests relate to code there are many different types of challenges associated with different kinds of project so you need to find something that fits your, your project and the last thing is don't get distracted by the tons of technologies out there just pick, focus on something and pick it up and get started with it and with that i end my talk there are a couple of resources out here that you can use if you're interested in terms of enriching yourself uh, and i am going to stop with that